while we're on the topic of shameless plugs, <laughs> um, I've got a number of books I have written uh, back on the book table. One is The Geology of Yellowstone, a biblical guide. Uh, this is one of the best laboratories for studying uh, the Genesis flood. So that's back there. Uh, this book, Fossils, Dinosaurs, and Cavemen, uh, has a section in it on Egyptian chronology. So if, you, uh, if you're so inclined, this book has that. I'm actually working through this with a few high school co-ops now. This is their high school textbook. Um, <clears throat> Geology for Kids, if you've got youngsters, grades three through six, an excellent little textbook for them. And something that mothers have always wanted, rock identification made easy. How do I keep my washer and dryer clean? And this one, this will help you do that. <laughs> if you are interested in pursuing uh, archaeology a little bit more, there's a wonderful book back there. This one is written by an archaeologist uh, by the name of David Down unwrapping the pharaohs and it's really quite good so uh, be sure to check that out too okay well let's get started here Egyptian chronology in the Bible uh, and since Heinz asked me to defend myself I'm going to do that so here's the question why is a geologist interested in Egyptian chronology <laughs> people scratch their head want to know what the connection is okay well here's the connection First of all, the entire secular, naturalistic, materialistic, uniformitarian system uh, of earth history and science is based on chronology. They have their chronology and they are rabid about it. This is what separates the biblical geologist from the secular geologist. It's the age of the earth. That is the big dividing line. It also happens to be one of the biggest dividing lines in the church. How old is the earth? It doesn't matter. It does matter. Some believe it's old, some believe it's young. And uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, arguing, fisticuffs going on over this, but chronology is a big deal. Uh, <clears throat> second of all, the Egyptian chronology is the gold standard of secular chronologies. And as we'll see as we go through this, it's not in harmony with the biblical chronology. So it's very important that we address this. If the Egyptian chronology is correct, then the Bible's a lie. That's just that simple, uh, the long and the short of it. And uh, third, the scriptures tell a different history based on different chronologies. Uh, and uh, they both can't be right at the same time. Either Egyptian chronology is correct, the archaeologists have it right, and our Bible is a lie, or they are in error, and the Bible is correct. I think the other thing we have to realize, too, is that if the biblical chronologies are in error, so is the biblical story of a Messiah. Very critical. The Messiah must demonstrate, first of all, that he was the second Adam, and uh, second of all, that he was a descendant of Abraham. You cannot do that without the biblical chronologies. And if the biblical chronologies are in error, we just don't have a Messiah. We don't have a Savior. We've got a myth. And it's time we recognize that uh, while we still got some life left, right? So that's what we're going to try to unravel. And that's why I'm interested in it. It really comes back to the biblical foundation. Either all of the Bible is true or none of it is true. That is the long and the short of it. This is a question I had to resolve early on. I was trained in secular geology and when I became a believer back in 1972 one of the first challenges in my life was trying to resolve whether Noah's flood really happened. And um, I had to come to grips with it. I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't just say well it's okay to believe that the Old Testament is mostly made up of myth and the New Testament is what you need to believe. But the biggest miracle of all took place in the New Testament, and it's based on stuff in the Old Testament. And if we can't resolve that issue in the Old Testament, boy, the whole thing would fall apart. And so that's where I was challenged many, many, many years ago. Uh, okay, let's um, dive in here to 
trying to unravel Egyptian chronology. First of all, today's accepted view of Egyptian chronology claims the support of archaeology. Well, is this true? Well, we have to realize that, uh, first of all, the, uh, the current archaeological presuppositions uh, that are applied to the evidence are all based in what we call the Enlightenment. Now, I don't think they teach this anymore in school, but it was a very critical time in Western civilization. All of Western civilization turned at that point from what it used to be, turned into a completely different direction. And that affected everything from that point on, from the 1700s on. The um, Enlightenment is really the view that only what can be formulated and verified by man is valid science, or is at least relevant. Uh, that's it. That's the essence of the Enlightenment. And all of geology took that course, all of biology, all of astronomy, and finally, archaeology in the late 1800s uh, all bought into that way of looking at things. Here's the consequence. The scriptures are rejected as authoritative and therefore inconsequential. The Bible is really not considered anymore to be a valid book of archaeology. Most of valid biblical history has been overlooked, skewing the archaeological evidence. We don't approach, scientists have bias just like the rest of us. And when they approach the evidence, they approach it with a bias. Most of them will admit they do not have a bias. And this is why there's a lot of blindness. Unless you are willing to admit that you have biases, I have biases. And I'm willing to admit those and I can clearly delineate them. Those are my choices. Because the evidence itself does not clear up the picture. Uh, what I'm going to present tonight is just one, I would say, of two or three ways of looking at the evidence. The evidence in itself has to be interpreted by human beings who have a bias. And that was, is what modern archaeology is all about. The predominant bias, of course, in science today is naturalism. And naturalism is an assumption. It's not been proven. It's an assumption that all phenomena or hypotheses commonly labeled as supernatural are either false or not inherently different from natural phenomena. Now, this is quite a leap. It's quite a jump. And this is what influences uh, modern archaeology as well. The modern bias in Egyptian chronology is this. The Bible is false or irrelevant, and by extension, so is the creation story, the global flood, and Israel's history. Other ancient sources are more reliable sources. This is the approach that you have. Now here's the rub. Secular historians say that the first dynasty of Egypt began in 3150 BC. Its pre-dynastic period goes back to 5000 BC. You don't have to answer this, but does anybody see a problem with that? If you know your Genesis story, we've got Egyptians living before the creation in some cases. <laughs> what? <laughs> and the flood, certainly. I'll see the scriptures say that the creation was around 4000 BC, the flood about 2344 BC, the Tower of Babel incident 2244 BC, and the earliest Egyptian civilization would then have begun sometime after 2244 BC. <coughs> now, <clears throat> this is a difference of about 900 years. Okay, you might be looking at this and say, okay, so what's the big deal? 900 years. When you're talking about ancient history, I mean, 900 years, it can't be all that much, right? 
Well, except that if you've read the Bible, you know that numbers are critical to biblical history. Every one of the kings shows when they became king, how long they ruled, and who came next. It's very tight, and those are very critical because all of the kings are related to the Messiah, the kings of Judah. So again, tie back into the Messiah. So all of these numbers are critical. I've been spending a lot of time reading through Exodus and, and uh, Numbers, and they <laughs> You can't read a page without the numbers, the importance of the numbers. They're very, very critical. Now, I'm sure you'll recognize all these guys' class pictures. There is uh, Isaac Newton, of course, now considered to be uh, one of, if not the greatest scientist who ever lived. There's uh, Kepler, and there's Galileo. We'd call all of these men brilliant scientists. Well, wait a minute here. They also were wackos because they believed that uh, and taught that the earth was about 6,000 years old and that there had been a global catastrophic flood. Isaac Newton believed that? Yes. As a matter of fact, you know, at the time he was alive, Newton was actually known more as a theologian. He had the largest theology library in the world. During the, when he was alive. And he was uh, considered to be a master theologian. Well, see, we know him today as a great scientist. But uh, he knew and understood the scriptures very well. <clears throat> Closer to my field, here's a fellow by the name of Nicholas Steno, uh, Danish anatomist and geologist. Uh, <clears throat> in his writing, Prodromus, 1669 wrote this, that the earth was 6,000 years old. Organic fossils and sedimentary strata were laid down by Noah's flood. Now here's where it relates to me. When I studied geology, we learned the principles uh, in geology, geological principles that are identified by everyone. One of them was called the uh, principle of superposition, which was formulated by the wacko Nicholas Steno. He set forth a set of principles for interpreting the rock record that are still in use today. Isn't that interesting? And yet he believed in a young earth and he believed in the chronologies of the Bible. You know, there was no way for people to tell how old the earth was. There still isn't. Um, you, uh, that, the way they, uh, their conclusion really came from studying the chronologies in the Old Testament. This is very interesting. Here's a table. You can see uh, some of the events. It's a table of remarkable eras and events. And here they start with the creation of the world, year zero, 4,007 years before Christ. And you might think here, you see the 4,007, you think, okay, that's, that's that Usher guy, Bishop Usher, right? Um, there's the deluge, or Noah's flood, gives the year and so on. You know where this came from? Encyclopedia Britannica, 1771. Isn't that interesting? What? Encyclopedia Britannica. The Britannica. The Britannica. This is what they thought. Here's another one from the same encyclopedia. Uh, this was under the heading Deluge. Uh, and uh, it says of this event, this was the most memorable, called the Universal Deluge, or Noah's Flood, which overflowed and destroyed the whole earth, and out of which only Noah and those with him in the ark escaped. This was accepted as a fact of history during this time, 1771. So the big question is, what changed the reliance on the biblical revelation about the past to one of rejection of the biblical revelation. It might surprise you, but it wasn't advancements in science. <clears throat> it was a change in philosophical outlook, again, called the Enlightenment. And this Enlightenment <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> influenced all of modern geology and later archaeology. The person who really began it all is this person here, James Hutton. 
uh, called the father of modern geology. Now, notice his statement here. Read it very carefully. The past history of our globe must be explained by what can be seen to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe. No action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. So all of a sudden, we've got a brand new way of looking at Earth history. Before it was decided by revelation. And in fact, that's really the only way to know the distant past. If you have uh, eyewitness accounts for recent events, such like the Revolutionary War or the Civil War, uh, then you can construct it based on eyewitnesses. But the further back in time you go, you've got to rely on some other sources. And for the believer, really, it's revelation. It's biblical revelation. The only way I know about the flood, the only way I know about the creation is because God chose to reveal it and to record it. Now, what Hutton was proposing was a little bit like taking uh, Harper's Weekly and just throwing it out the window for constructing the Civil War. I've got the book here at home in my library featuring all the articles that were written uh, on the Civil War during the Civil War by Har Harper's Weekly people. It's an amazing history. Now, just think about it. If we took that out and just ignored it, what kind of a reconstruction of history could you do? It would be pretty sparse, <coughs> because the Harper's Weekly is, uh, was the criminal creme during this time. Hutton developed an idea called uniformitarianism. And it's a reliance on what can be observed now to explain what happened in the past. In other words, biblical revelation was out. Shortly after Hutton came a fellow by the name of Lyell who popularized uh, Hutton's ideas with the phrase, the present is the key to the past. Well, you see, that's in conflict with the biblicist who would say revelation is the key to the past because I can't know the past. I can't figure it out. I can try to reconstruct it, but I can't figure it out. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Lyell's personal goal, and I didn't know this when I took geology. His personal goal was to eliminate any reference to Genesis in geology. Lyell is credited with having dealt the death blow to catastrophism, and a global flood. And this was in the 1830s to about the 1860s. Now still, there's no archaeology on the scene yet. You had people interested in the, in the uh, relics and things like this. They were pulling stuff out of Egypt. No one could read the hieroglyphs. It was a real mystery. No one understood Egyptian uh, culture, or Egyptian history. It was all just a big closed book. But uh, geology was setting the stage for archaeology. Lyell advocated an earth that was perhaps several hundred million years old. And essentially what he did was then uh, say that the biblical flood was out. You can begin to see how everything is toppling during the 1800s. This was not because of science. Uh, Hutton, James Hutton was a physician. Uh, he wasn't a trained geologist. Lyell was not a geologist, he was an attorney. So the, this was philosophy that was changing things, not brilliant scientific discoveries. Fossil collecting was done by uh, just individuals, and it was very young uh, and uh, not well advanced. So then the final person to come along, of course, is Charles Darwin. When he wrote the book, uh, his book in 1859, the first copy sold out the day it was published. Theologians quickly labeled Darwin the most dangerous man in England. And you can see why, because his ideas really helped then drive the biblical creation out. So we've got the biblical, the, the Bible is, is reliable history, that's out. The flood is out. That's what Isaac Newton used to uh, explain the rock layers. That was out. 
and now creation takes an alternate, uh, an alternate story. So here's what we'll do then. We can construct this step-by-step -step dismantling of biblical influence in science this way. First of all, biblical history is too short. This is what Hutton thought. In fact, he, he said this. He taught this. The, obviously, the ages that the Bible gives is too, is too short because the earth looks older than what the Bible says. That was his reasoning. Uh, there must be an ancient prehistory. So all of a sudden now the Bible's chronology is being questioned. <clears throat> Second of all, the discovery of this prehistory must be by men of science. This ruled out any kind of influence from theologians or pastors or people who spoke the word of God. This is kind of where we got the, uh, the, the dilemma I think we still face today, which is you have church on Sunday and you have science during the week. It separated this whole thing. So we compartmentalize our science. We get it from the, the scientists over here who believe in an old earth. And then we get our religion on Sunday from those who believe the Bible. And somehow we're comfortable living that way. And I know when I became a believer, I, I saw that. I thought, no, I'm not comfortable with that. It's either true or it's not true. But this is what, this is what was going on. The third thing that happened was that prehistory must be interpreted by uniformitarianism, this new science. Nothing should be interpreted by biblical revelation or by theology. It was all to be interpreted by what we see happening now. One of the fruits of that is the Colorado River cut the Grand Canyon. That's the only way to look at it, so say scientists. There are other ways to look at it, but you have to allow the flood in there. But that's not what uniformitarianism will allow. Secular geology eliminates the biblical flood. Of course, if the biblical flood didn't happen, man, most of Genesis didn't happen. And now the foundation for Egypt as the biblicists understood it, foundation for Joseph, who helped deliver Egypt out of famine, Moses, the uh, Exodus, all of that was now suspect. And uh, meanwhile, we're still comfortable embracing a Messiah on Sunday. You see, it, it's sometimes we just don't put the two things together. Secular biology eliminates the biblical creation. And then... Late 1800s, modern archaeology comes on the scene. Secular ar archaeology eliminates the biblical chronology. That is the complete worldview that developed in the 1800s. Now, when we're, uh, we see archaeologists over in uh, Israel and Egypt digging away and finding all of this stuff, discoveries. I watch all this stuff going on on, on PBS and some of these other stations. It's fascinating stuff. They're finding all kinds of things, developing new technologies to look into the ground, see what's in there. This is all fascinating stuff. And it's there. All the evidence is real. The problem is it's being interpreted through a different set of glasses. And I'm not sure that we totally buy into that. We think that somehow the evidence will speak the truth. And it doesn't. Evidence must be uh, interpreted. I never forget, I kind of had an epiphany when I was a kid, sort of doing some fossil hunting, and all of a sudden it struck me. I picked up a fossil, I looked at it, and all of a sudden it just, it hit me. How old is this fossil? There's nothing written there. It doesn't have a date on it. And it just, you know, well, I knew that, but it just suddenly dawned on me that something else has to tell me <clears throat> how old that fossil is. And it's certainly not science. Science can't determine that. But a philosophy can. And that philosophy is that I have to buy into these steps that we looked at. And then the process for dating that fossil will come alive. But you see, not without sacrificing my entire worldview. That's what's involved in it. Now, <clears throat> the Enlightenment then gave us the religion of deism that God had created, but he was far off somewhere. It gave us the new science of uniformitarianism, gave us a new scientific idea of origins, 
gave us a new scientific chronology of history. Every single secular book that you pick up on earth science begins exactly the way Genesis begins. You know, you open Genesis and what's the first line? In the beginning, God created the space and the earth. What's the first line in a secular earth history book? In the beginning, 15 billion years ago. You see, it's copy. It's a direct copy of what Genesis has to say. It's an alternate history of the earth. And then everything flows from that. So by the time you get to uh, Egypt, whoa, the Bible just is irrelevant. But it's all built off of this flow here. So, enter archaeology. Here's a book called Archaeology of, of the Land of the Bible. I have this book on my shelf uh, from the writer. David and Solomon are portrayed in the Bible as two of the greatest kings of the ancient world. Yet within the conventional chronology, a suitable context of their reigns cannot be found. Really. The Bible is the only written source concerning the united monarchy, and it is therefore the basis of any historical presentation of the period. So right away, the Bible is just not relevant. This is biblical archaeology. I used to subscribe to this magazine, and um, <clears throat> I get so unsettled after reading it. Most of the articles in the magazine are either an attempt to correct the Bible or flatly contradict it. it wonderful pictures in it. It's up on the latest uh, arche uh, the archaeological digs and so on. And then when they get to their interpretation, it's kind of like, man, I can't believe the Bible anymore. I can see the evidence, but wow, they make it impossible to believe the Bible. The spirit of the Enlightenment is this. If the Bible says it, it must be wrong. The scriptures cannot be trusted. Here's um, author of a book, Donald Redford. It says, such topics as the foreign policy of David and Solomon, Solomon's trade in horses, or his marriage to Pharaoh's daughter, must remain themes for midrash and fictional treatment. There's a book, In Search of Ancient Israel. The evidence recently accumulated by Jameson Drake at least shows the impossibility of a Davidic empire administered from Jerusalem. It is necessary for us to exclude the Davidic and Solomonic monarchies, let alone their empire, from a non-biblical history of Palestine. And I don't think they stop to think about this, but as a serious believer, I look at this and say, well, if that's true, I really don't have a Bible. I, it doesn't mean anything. It's full of myth, lies, fairy tales, and I might as well get rid of it now, because all of us know that as we try to follow it, it is very tough. Would you agree with me on that? It's very tough. It's a very tough life God has asked us to live. So if it's not true, why bother? But anyway, they would have you believe that it is just a myth. So does the archaeological evidence really prove the Bible to be in error? Well, most archaeologists today would say yes. Here's an archaeologist, an Egyptologist, said that... Uh, most archaeologists realize the Egyptian chronology has problems which they'd rather pass over. And here's the legitimate question. Could it be that archaeologists have an abundance of evidence but have put it in the wrong time? Put it on the wrong shelf. The evidence is real, it's there, but because it doesn't fit their approach to interpreting the evidence, it goes on a different shelf. And if that's what's happening, certainly it wouldn't make sense. If there's evidence for the Exodus that's not put within the time of the Exodus, but in some other time, then, yeah, it's not going to make sense at all. And the Bible then would look like, well, it, this is a myth that you're reading about. Well, what about carbon dating? Doesn't it prove that the Bible is in error? And again, from David Down said, I've used carbon-14 dating. Frankly, among archaeologists, carbon dating is a big joke. What? I thought this is how they proved the age of their finds. They send samples to laboratories to be dated. 
If it comes back and agrees with the dates they've already decided from the style of pottery, they will say carbon-14 dating of this sample confirms our conclusions. But if it doesn't agree, they just think the laboratory has got it wrong, and that's the end of it. It's only a, short, a showcase. Archaeologists never, let me emphasize this, never date their finds by carbon-14. They only quote it if it agrees with their conclusions. And of course what that shows us is that there's something wrong with that system. Uh, it, it, there's a number of problems with it. Archaeologists have acknowledged this. So in the long and the short of it is Egyptian chronology is in a mess. First of all, the scriptures have been rejected as a reliable witness of history. When you do that, you leave out a lot of things that could help build a proper view of Old Testament history. But if you've rejected it, then you're closed off from a lot of uh, valuable information. Certainly, the conclusions you draw are going to be skewed. Second of all, the pharaohs were human. They were competitor, and they told a lot of lies about themselves. The inscriptions on some of these uh, Egyptian artifacts are, I mean, it's like, you know, remember Muhammad Ali? I remember if you, any of you get a chance to watch him fight, you know, I, some of you are not that old. I'll admit. But Muhammad Ali was one of the biggest braggarts there was. <laughs> Well, a lot of these pharaohs did the same thing. Third, the pharaohs had multiple names. They also ruled at the same time as sons in many, many cases. And uh, the secular sources rely on the chronology of a Greek Egyptian priest named Manito. We'll talk about him in a little bit here. Uh, and there have been monumental mistakes made in translation of inscriptions. We're going to look at one tonight by the famous Champollion, the fellow who translated the Rosetta Stone, called the father of Egyptology. He made a mistake. What? Yes, he made a mistake that really set the foundation for modern archaeological interpretation. There continues to be a bias against the history portrayed in the scriptures, and this is unfounded. So let's talk about Champollion. 1799 is when Napoleon was in Egypt. He took along a number of people with him, uh, scientists, archaeologists, and so on, uh, at least what was known of archaeology at the time, and they found this stone. Uh, it called, and they called it the Rosetta Stone. Uh, they gave it to Champollion, and uh, he translated it. It was written in three different languages, but it was served as a key. There was hieroglyphs, the big mystery. There was Greek, and then there was Egyptian script. And so he began to put the pieces together and suddenly opened the door to the study of ancient Egypt because now we understood the hieroglyphs. We could translate them. Um, Champollion re relied on a list, and uh, modern archaeology, Egyptology, relies on this same list today, uh, compiled by an Egyptian priest under Ptolemy named Manito. He attempted to compile a list of Egyptian kings. Up through Champollion, Manito was considered to be the only authorized standard, and is still relied on today. Uh, Manito's king list is really the gold standard of Egypt's pharaohs, of compiling Egypt's pharaohs today. Here's what they've uncovered, though, about Manito's list. Some of the names cannot be found in history. Some of the pharaohs are duplicated because they have different names. So there's additions of years. Does not account for pharaohs who ruled at the same time and does not account for father's son who ruled at the same time. You see this with the kings in Israel also. If you look at some of the charts, you'll see in some cases the sons were ruling at the same time as their fathers. Uh, now the Bible is pretty clear on the numbers, the reigns of the kings, so we have that very, very clear, uh, clearly delineated. But in Egyptology, 
Um, it's not, that distinction is not made. So this is the father of Egyptology. In 1822, and this has been a monumental mistake <clears throat> that still has implications today, he mistranslated an Egyptian inscription and consequently misidentified Pharaoh Sheshonk I with the biblical Shishak in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. This was huge. This translation by the brilliant Champollion has become the cornerstone of Egyptian chronology. Now here's an Egyptian uh, uh, or Egyptologist by the name of David Roll. Uh, he said that in 1888, Champollion's mistake had been correctly translated. However, the misidentification of Shishak with Sheshonk was not overturned, and it has remained the cornerstone of ancient chronology. And that threw the chronology off by several hundred years uh, since then. And here's the effect of it. All of us will remember this, the Ten Commandments, 1956. I used to watch this every year, you know, you'd sit in front of the TV around Easter time, and uh, they'd show the Ten Commandments. You could see uh, Charlton Heston. Boy, is that really what Moses looked like? And Ewell Brenner plays Ramesses. The only problem is that if you correct for the mistakes of that Champollion made, you'll find out that Ramses II really came 350 years too soon. Uh, rather, uh, the, <laughs> he belongs at a later time, not during the time of Moses, which is where contemporary archaeology places him, during the time of Moses. And no wonder they can't find the evidence. Uh, because if this, if this is what they're doing, then everything associated with Ramesses is... is determining how they're going to look at Moses and the Exodus. And the, the evidence there they found already is just sitting on another shelf. But they won't correct the years. Even the message, of course, was changed. The message of the Old Testament is God leading his people out to a promised land to be his people. Well, here's the message, 1956. Man should be free from slavery and oppression. So, you know, not only do we have the kings being changed, but the message is being changed. Everything got changed. How many of us developed our Old Testament theology based on the Ten Commandments? I watched it a lot as a kid. It was our favorite time of the year. Watch the Ten Commandments. It's a great, great movie. Just filled with a lot of error, that's all. <laughs> so, if we revise the chronology and adjust it for Champollion's mistake, rather, Ramses really is the pharaoh Shishak. And during the time, of course, of Rehoboam, this is when the temple was ransacked by the pharaoh of Egypt. The only one who could have done it at the time was, would have been Ramesses, one of the wealthiest pharaohs in all of Egyptian history. Now, the need for revision of the quote-unquote sacred Egyptian chronology is being acknowledged by more and more Egyptologists. This book here, Pharaohs and Kings, written by David Roll, if you can find this book, it's out of print now. And when I bought it years ago, uh, it cost me a hundred bucks. I mean, this was, but I thought, you know, I'm going to invest in this book. This, this, is, this is a fabulous book. In the book, David Roll tells you that he is an agnostic. But he is convinced that the archaeologists <clears throat> have made crucial mistakes when it comes to the history of the Bible, and that the history of the Old Testament should be trusted. This is coming from an agnostic, that we believers have struggles with accepting all the Old Testament, don't we? This guy doesn't, and he's an agnostic. He lists 40 archaeological discoveries that verify the scriptural accounts of Joseph and Moses, but have been ignored because the current Egyptian chronology has been the standard for 200 years. It is off as much as 800 to 1,000 years. Now, if you start adjusting the chronology, well, naturally nothing is going to fit. And it looks like God didn't leave anything. But he, this book is fabulous. He goes through 40 archaeological discoveries that have already been made, some of them uh, 100 years old, just that they've been put in the wrong time frame. Well, so 
what if the Egyptian chronology was revised forward 800 to 1,000 years? What would be the evidence for the early chapters of Genesis, Joseph, and Moses, and how would Egyptian chronology line up? So that's what we're going to take a look at here. We took the long way to get here, but this gives you an idea of what we've been working with over the last many, many years. This is one of the most profound things here, and that is this. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Arabic here, but it's, it's translated, it's Egyptian for the Arab Republic of Egypt. Notice the word miser. Well, that should sound familiar, yes, because it comes from Mizraim. Now, who is Mizraim? Anybody know that right off? Do you know your Old Testament chronology well enough? Mizraim was the grandson of who? Noah. He was the son of Ham. Oh, wow. I mean, there's a connection to the biblical chronology. Mizraim. And the Egyptians recognize it. They recognize it. The word miser is from the Hebrew Mizraim. Genesis 10.6, one of the sons of Ham. In Genesis 12.10, it is translated Egypt. Isn't that curious? Where Abraham travels to Egypt, the first mention of Pharaoh. Now, I've been going through my Old Testament. And what the English does in many cases is they transliterate the word. So Egypt is really a, it's a transliteration of the Greek word. But what I've been doing is I've been crossing out Egypt and writing Misraim above it. Because now we trace the history of Egypt as beginning with Misraim, the grandson of Noah. Would have been after the flood, after the Tower of Babel. There's our connection, and that sets the tone for interpreting the evidence. So you have Noah, Ham, Misraim, who founded Egypt after the Tower of Babel around 2200 BC. If we revise the chronology, then this character here, King Menes, or Narmur, is the first king of Egypt established, who established the first dynasty of Egypt. Could he be Misraim? Well, Eusebius, the famous historian around 300 AD, identified King Menes as Mestrium or Mizraim, the first king of Egypt. Again, there's the biblical connection. This is an interesting find. 2001, 14 wooden boats were discovered in Egypt from the first dynasty. They were sealed in mud brick casing and not dismantled, but intact. Now that's key because all of the subsequent burials of pharaohs uh, they would dismantle the things that the pharaohs would need in their afterlife, among which were their favorite boats. And they were usually used for pleasure in the afterlife. Uh, but these are intact. The boats were around 81 feet long. Naval archaeologist Cheryl Ward said that she was amazed by the high degree of technical skill shown by these artifacts. What happens if we revise the chronology? Could these be a reminder of Noah's time just 190 years before and buried for the afterlife just in case? See, another flood. There's the connection. In subsequent times, boats were dismantled and used more for the Pharaoh's pleasure in the afterlife. Now keep in mind, Noah would have still been alive during this time. How old was Noah when he died? It was over 900 years, wasn't he? So he was living during the, the settlement and the establishment of early Egypt. What do you think Noah was doing that time? Well, we don't know for sure, do we? But I am guessing, having gone through the flood and seeing the corruption of man and what God had done to the corruption of man, I would guess that he and Shem were probably not idle. They were probably missionaries. I'm guessing they were preaching like fury. Look, do you not see? We are the living a uh, reminder to you that God judged your wickedness. And I would say that's what he, now that's my opinion, but it makes sense. Now here's a very interesting uh, stele, King Zet, Pharaoh Zet. I want you to look at this stele very, very closely. He's the fourth Pharaoh of the first dynasty. He took as the sign of his name the serpent. 
Now, I don't know if you've read much about Greek mythology and uh, Hindu mythology and so on. The serpent plays a prominent part in all of these religions, just as it did in the garden. What did the serpent do in the garden? He was the source of enlightenment, wasn't he? Uh, he was the source of changing Eve's and Adam's mind to distrusting God and believing him. Well, I'm not sure exactly. We don't have a commentary on King Zet, but there you see the serpent. If we revise the chronology, this puts it right after the, shortly after the flood. Could this correspond to the serpent of the garden? Perhaps a reminder of the story of the garden. Perhaps in honor of the one who may have helped him to gain power. Serpent was, was played a vital part. It's very interesting. One of the big seven wonders of the world is this huge statue of Athena. Uh, and we're all awestruck by this goddess of war holding a shield and a spear. And it's a beautiful statue. It's a reproduction. The original doesn't exist anymore. But people don't notice it. But the next time you look up online here and find the statue of Athena, and what will you find down at her feet? The serpent. Well, what do you think? Maybe the serpent is behind a lot of this stuff that's going on. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. But only if you start with the Bible as a valid source of history. You get a, you get a different perspective on life, don't you? 1922 to 1934, Sir Leonard Woolley discovered... Ur as the first civilization with superior knowledge of astronomy and arithmetic. What happens if we revise the chronology? Terah, the father of Abraham, would have been living at the time of Zoser, of the third dynasty of Egypt. Zoser's pyramid was a step pyramid, and it's very similar to the great ziggurats that were probably part of the Tower of Babel. What do you think? I think Zoser had a little bit more in mind uh, than just simply building a pyramid. I think some of these were more memorials of maybe a historical event that happened not too long ago in their lifetimes. If King Zoser reigned during the lifetime of Terah, this would have been 220 years after the flood, 121 years after the Tower of Babel. See how close it was? 121 years. My goodness, that's... What, how, how old is that's almost what Theodore Roosevelt, right? Just about <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt. How many of you were alive in here when Teddy Roosevelt was president? Any of you? Well, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? <laughs> but it, nobody denies that he was president of the United States. That's how fresh it is in our minds. And I'm thinking here's 121 years after Tower of Babel, how fresh that incident would have been in their minds. And uh, Noah would have been 821 years old. Shem would have been 391 years old. The stories of the flood and the Tower of Babel would have still been in the memory, maybe even still preached by Noah and Shem. See, now we're starting to construct this stuff in the Bible as lining up with the evidence that we've already found. Very, very interesting. Let's put it on a kind of a chronological scale here. Uh, at least for the first few. There you have the Tower of Babel about 100 years after the flood. You have uh, King Menes, the first pharaoh of Egypt, or Misraim. Then 191 years, you've got Pharaoh Zoser. And, uh, and then shortly after, Terah and Abraham. Abraham was born 290 years after the flood, 191 years after the Tower of Babel. Abraham was probably well aware of what happened. I mean, you think about it, Noah, this old, old man who was in his 800s, I mean, he was probably either a joke to a lot of people or a lot of people wondered, okay, is this guy serious? I mean, this, this is one of these patriarchs. Imagine if George Washington were still alive here walking around on our streets. You know, I'm sure there'd be people thinking, the guy's a joke. Some of us would, hey, let's go talk to him. And uh, I'm sure he had that kind of influence. Maybe Abraham was influenced. He was still alive. Noah was still alive when Abraham was born. So what about the purposes of these 
pyramid structures, they really only make sense in light of the scriptures. If the chronology is revised, the pyramids really become, or the, the big towers really become uh, memorials to these great events that took place. Again, they exist all over the world. Some of them in our own hemisphere. And uh, there's the connection. Now, we talked about Sir Leonard Woolley. It's very interesting here that Josephus tells us, and, and I'm not going to say that Josephus is the most reliable witness, but a lot of historians utilize him, and at least this is what he says. Abraham brought arithmetic and astronomy from the Chaldeans to Egypt. It's well known they were far advanced. Now, here's where it might line up. If the chronology is revised, King Khufu, or the Greeks Cheops, the great pyramid builder, he was called. According to Josephus, it was Abraham who brought arithmetic and astronomy to Egypt when he went there in about 1875 BC because of a famine in the land. The Chaldeans were far more advanced than the Egyptians in math and astronomy. This might explain why the pyramids suddenly take on the characteristic shape that they have become known for during Khufu's time. This is the Great Pyramid of Giza, built for Khufu. Well, what do you think? Do you think maybe it might have been corrected by proper mathematics? There's a real possibility. Not dogmatic here, but it does show you that if we start revising the chronology and correcting for some of the mistakes, all this stuff lines up real nicely. The pyramids and ziggurats around the world were a continual throwback to Babel. It seems that men were continually striving for the more perfect pyramid. Abraham would have visited Egypt when Khufu was pharaoh. Archaeologists agree that it was during Khufu's reign that there uh, was an explosion of uh, astronomical and mathematical expertise. The first truly mathematically correct pyramid was developed during his reign. The pyramids subsequent or uh, before Khufu's time, were, uh, were far inferior. There's the one, the bent period, uh, pyramid it's called. Uh, they couldn't get the, the measurements right. They would collapse in on itself. And uh, the step pyramid was an attempt to uh, certainly have that pyramid look, but they just couldn't figure it out until they had the right mathematics. If we revise the chronology, then Joseph would have lived in Egypt during the reign of Pharaoh Sesostris I. Now, it is known that Sesostris I had a prime minister or a vizier named Mentuhotep, who had exceptional ruling power. What do you think? Possible, isn't it? Could be Joseph. Mentuhotep appears as the alter ego of the king, writes one archaeologist. When he arrived, the great personages bowed down before him at the outer door of the royal palace. Well, that lines up perfectly with what the scriptures say about Joseph. Here's a very interesting statue here I put uh, on the side. The statue found in 1987 in Egypt is not Egyptian. He has reddish blonde hair and in a style that's not typical of Egyptian. He is also wearing what appears to be a coat of many colors. No reference to Joseph now, you understand. No, there is, isn't there? <laughs> uh, and it could be that Joseph was Mentuhotep during the reign of Sesostris. It makes sense. If we revise the chronology, there is a canal in Egypt Guess what? It's called, and still used today, it's called Joseph's Canal in Egypt. There uh, is a very long canal, over 200 miles, that fed from the Nile in Middle Egypt and feeds into an enormous lake known as the Fayum. The, ca uh, the canal is known by the name Bar Yosef, which is an Egyptian name meaning the canal of Joseph. Isn't that interesting? In the revised chronology, this canal would have been placed during the time of Joseph in Egypt. I'm not going to read this next one, but um, an archaeologist uh, did find some inscriptions that actually recorded 
the famine that went on during this period. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite telling. But this would have been why the canal would have been constructed, to get water into the land. The inscription is ascribed to an official by the name of uh, Ameni. Governor under Sesostris I reads, No one was unhappy in my days, not even in the years of famine, for I had tilled all the fields of the name of Ma. Thus I prolonged the life of its inhabitants and preserved the food which it preserved. Well, that's a very, very, very uh, real line up here with what went on in Genesis. I saw this particular find um, on an archaeological program here several years ago. Austrian archaeologist Manfred Bietak excavating in the area known to have been accompanied by Israel discovered a place of a high government official. The tombs had been robbed and a statue had been defaced. The statue is significant because it is not Egyptian. Could this have been the vengeance taken on the famous personage of Joseph when Israel left Egypt? David Roll, the Egyptian uh, archaeologist, does believe so. And there you see the statue uh, and the uh, artifact that was found in Egypt. Looks just like it. If we revise the chronology, then there's evidence of Israel's arrival into Egypt. This is... Uh, a reconstruction of the fresco of the arrival of the Asiatics or Israelites at Beni Hassan. The Egyptian scribes standing at the right are facilitating the border formalities. And if you look at the differences between the Egyptians here and the Israelites, you'll notice they're the same as the statue that we looked at, the same hairstyle. If the chronology is revised, there is evidence reconstruction of the fresco. There it is. There are the Israelites. There are some more Israelites coming into Egypt. If we revise the chronology and account for the mistake, there is evidence, confirmation of Israelite slaves in Egypt. This um, rather friendly looking character is a Menemhet III and he had a mud brick Pyramid. Does that ring any bells? During the 12th dynasty, in the revised chronology, the 12th dynasty would have been the time of the oppression of the Israelites. All the pyramids were built of mud and straw during this time, not stone. That's fascinating, isn't it? And you can see it doesn't last long. Petri discovered, as an English Egyptologist, pioneer of systematic methodology. He's the one who gave us the, the system of dating by pottery. Uh, he discovered a stele, uh, the stele of Merneptah, that lists Israel. He's famous for this find, but he also did excavations uh, in the Fayum where the Israelites were. He discovered evidence of the slaughter of the Israelite babies in Egypt. This is a box now in the Manchester Museum. Petri found many such boxes beneath the floors of the houses he excavated at Cahun, the city of the Israelite occupation. They contain the skeletons of babies up to three months old, sometimes three in a box. They were probably the bones of the Israelite babies who were killed on Pharaoh's orders. Isn't that interesting? Again, that's already been discovered a long time ago. It was just sitting on a different shelf the wrong time. These seemingly insignificant finds now become significant if the chronology is revised. There's plenty of evidence from Moses and Israel in Egypt. Petri excavated the city now called Cahun in the Fayum. He discovered evidence of large population of residents from Israel who lived during the reign of Sesostris II. There you can see the area where Israel resided. There's also confirmation of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. This is another pharaoh with a nasty disposition. <laughs> Look at his face. This is Sesostris III, one of the pharaohs of the oppression. 
Notice the sour expression on his face. He was known as a cruel king. One of his slogans was, aggression is valor, while retreat is cowardice. Yes, I would say so. Amenemhet III had two daughters. No sons have been identified. One daughter, Sobekneferu, is said by Josephus to have been childless and to be the adopted mother of Moses. So there she is. Now, this child supposedly became known as Amenemhet IV, the adopted son of Sobekneferu and adopted successor to Amenemhet III. Amenemhet IV is a mystery. He seems to have disappeared from history without any explanation. Could this be Moses? It fits. Could be. And there you see a, a, a statue of Amenemhet IV. Doesn't look like Charlton Heston, does he? <laughs> Amenemhet III reigned for 46 years and left no heir. If Moses was Amenemhet IV, he left Egypt around 40 years old, which is, of course, what the scriptures say. Uh, he, his foster mother, Sobekneferu, then ruled Egypt for a few years. The 12th dynasty ended abruptly. Nothing of Amenemhet IV's disappearance has been recorded. It could have been Moses who fled Egypt at the time. If we revise the chronology, there's evidence of the Exodus. This is Neferhotep I of Dynasty 13. He's the pharaoh of the Exodus in the revised chronology. His mummy has never been found. It was during the reign, his reign, that the Asiatic or Israelites slaves suddenly disappeared from Egypt and the mysterious Hyksos suddenly took over in Egypt. Egypt was a powerful country. Why did the Hyksos take over? Well, could be that Neferhotep is at the bottom of the sea, number one. Uh, number two could be the sudden departure of the slaves uh, as Israel left Egypt, consequently left a huge vacuum. Remember, the whole army of Pharaoh was overthrown in the sea. That would have left a power vacuum in Egypt. Well, who were these Hyksos? Well, the Hyksos could have been the Amalekites. Remember the story in Exodus where Moses encounters the Amalekites. Israel was going one way, the Amalekites were coming the other way. And I am guessing, again an opinion, that the Hyksos could have been, those mysterious Hyksos could have been the Amalekites who took over in Egypt for a while and weren't displaced for, uh, it, was, it was a long time. Evidence of the Exodus. Here's the uh, magician's rod from the same period, now on display in England. Remember the story of the rods becoming uh, serpents. There's evidence of the plagues in Egypt. This is a papyrus. Um, <clears throat> in, now in the Leiden Museum in Holland. This is some of, little bit of the quote. Plague stalks through the land and blood is everywhere. Nay, but the river is blood. Does a man drink from it? As a human, he rejects it. He thirsts for water. Nay, but gates, columns, and walls are consumed with fire. Nay, but the son of the high-born man is no longer to be recognized. The stranger people from outside are come into Egypt. Nay, but corn has perished everywhere. Everyone says there is no more. Now, this kind of describes what was going on, wasn't it, during the plagues uh, that God had uh, ushered in on Egypt. Well, there is evidence of the plagues, and this is a coffin you're looking at here. This coffin is Neferhotep's son, Waneferhotep. He did not succeed his father on the throne. This is his coffin, the boy's coffin. It, was he the firstborn that was killed by the last plague? It's very real, isn't it? At least it lines up with what we're looking at. Uh, there's evidence of the exodus. Here's one archaeologist says it is evident that the completion of the king's pyramid was not the reason why Cahun's inhabitants, or the Israelites, eventually or deserted the town, abandoning their tools and other possessions in the shops and houses. 
the quantity, range, and type of the artifact or articles of everyday use which were left behind in the houses may suggest that the departure was sudden and unprecedented. Well, this was the Israelites needing to eat the Passover in haste. You remember that story? <laughs> it's getting kind of getting back into the, 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 the catalogs of our mind, isn't it? Back to about B.C. 700, there is agreement between the history of Egypt and the biblical records. But earlier than that, there, is, there are serious discrepancies. And I think these discrepancies appear to be, again, the result. We'll just kind of review here. The influence of the Enlightenment, this bias against the biblical records. Number two, the mistaken identification of Shashank I with Shishak from the Bible by Champollion, a mistake that has not been corrected since it was first made. Uh, the reliance on Medito's faulty king list. As a result, all of the chronology of ancient Egypt is off by as much as 800 to 1,000 years. David Down makes this observation. The scribes of Israel were meticulous in copying their sacred writings. When a reduced chronology of Egypt is adopted, remarkable agreement can be found between Egypt and Israel. And many Egyptian characters unnamed in the Bible can be identified with known Egyptians. So it's Egyptian chronology in the Bible. Here is the question. Which is the correct standard? That's the real question, isn't it? And I would submit to you that we as believers have a responsibility. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have to trust the scriptures. And, uh, and then we resolve things from that. That's our unshakable foundation. That, that is the authoritative word. That's the revelation. Everything else can then be put into proper perspective if we account for the biases. The real problem in modern science seems to be that most scientists do not recognize that they even have biases. And this is a, this is a real problem. I think most scientists really do believe that they approach uh, the study of nature uh, strictly from an unbiased view. And that's not a healthy viewpoint. All of us are biased. Okay, well that ends our little uh, presentation tonight. I don't know whether I'll try to answer any questions. I don't know if you want to do that now. If, if, there, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to Thank him uh, for the uh, talk he gave here. <laughs> and we have time for a few questions. So formulate your questions. In the meantime, we're going to have the ushers come forward and those that feel they would like to help support this ministry, uh, this will be your opportunity to, to do so. Uh, let's make the questions short. Raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll bring the mic around. So going back to your statement that Lyell said that the earth was millions of years old, so he figured that out just by, as he would say, looking at something and then going backwards. Really, what that's a very good question. Lyell, <clears throat> they, by the time the Enlightenment was in full swing, the biblical chronology had already been rejected, and so was the flood. So they, the only alter, alternative to a young earth approach was an ancient earth. So when you look at things like how fast rivers are moving, and then you reinterpret the erosive process that rivers cause, and you, you start doing some figuring, you can project into the past how long it would have taken for this particular river to do this much damage. And uh, as they began to do this kind of figuring, uh, they came up with perhaps, I mean, this was always the argument. They weren't firm in it. It was always perhaps the earth is hundreds of millions of years old. Um, and it, there was an incident that shows up in Lyell's writing. In the early 1800s, he visited Niagara Falls. Now this was one of the things that stumbled my faith as a, as a youngster when I saw this. He, came, he went to Niagara Falls, studied the falls, and came back and announced that the, uh, the falls was 40,000 years old. And um, of course that was printed, and that stumbled a lot of people. And of course this was authoritative science. They figured this out, watching the water come over the falls, 
and then calculating how long it would have taken for the falls to form. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Except what they failed to take into consideration was that there were tons of observations that recorded different flow patterns for the falls. And so they ranged all the way from a few feet a year to several feet a year. Now, what happened to those estimates? If you figured all of those into the mix, you did come up with some that lined up perfectly with the Bible. What that lesson I learned many, many, many years after that was that you cannot measure the past based upon what you see going on in the present. There are too many variables. The biggest variable is the flood. If the flood took place, it's all moot. <laughs> The, the whole age of the earth is a moot issue. The flood laid down all of that stuff. So, yeah, it's made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Two, Another question here. Okay. Two quick questions. Um, if you revise the Egyptian, Egyptian chronologi, chronology, yeah, whatever, yeah. Oh, yeah. then that would mean that you would have to revise some of the neighboring countries' chronological um, information as well, their history, because there's proof that Country, um, other kings, kings and queens from other countries surrounding Egypt actually ruled in Egypt. And then there's also um, documentation because there were universities across Africa yep. um, and there's cave paintings. So if you revise Egyptian history, don't you have to revise the other countries as well? And my other question is, I believe it's, um, um, if you revise it, where uh, I believe it's King Tuck's father or grandfather who believed in one God, where would that place him? Would that, that would have to place him at what time? Well, I, um, I can't, I don't know the figure at the top of my head, but you're, the one thing that you are right on is that it's a domino effect. Once you start adjusting for these things, you're going to have to adjust the whole ball of wax. And uh, there, there are... Uh, some of the other chronologies, Babylonian chronologies and so on, I mean, those are so ridiculous. Uh, even archaeologists acknowledge them. They, the king's list goes back 30, 40,000 years. But wait a minute. You know, I, they even acknowledge this is, this is hooey. So the Egyptian chronology is put together by this Egyptian priest named Manito is the standard. He's all by himself in that. Um, and that has served as the gold standard for measuring all chronology. So if you start playing with it, yeah, you're right. Everything's going to have to be readjusted. But if we set up a new standard, which is the scriptures, we know the scriptures, and we know we can follow the chronology. It's easy to add up. You start with Adam. Adam uh, was so many years old when he begat Seth. And Seth was so many years when he begat a son, and so on. You can follow the chronology down. You add up the years. Jude is another one. Uh, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Well, that makes it pretty airtight. And you start adding all these pieces together, and now you've got a very tight chronology. Well, all of these others then really have to be revised accordingly. But that's the bias that won't allow them to do that. I think the other thing, too, that you have to realize is that if you start changing these chronologies, what you think of a lot of reputations are on the line. Um, I, I, I mean, it just boggles the imagination, some of the consequences for doing it. But you are right. It's a domino effect. Two quick questions. Uh, with the chronology you described, when do you put the Ice Age? You know, the woolly mammoths with... Uh, yeah, very stuff. good question, because, boy, that one's not mentioned in the Bible, is it? No. No. <laughs> what do you do with an Ice Age? Well, the only possible way to fit it, because, I mean, at, before Adam, what existed? God. So you can't have the Ice Age happen before Adam, and between Adam and Noah, approximately 1,600 years, if the Ice Age took place then, the flood would have washed all evidence away. So the first 1,600 years of Earth history, Ice Age can't fit there. The last Ice Age supposedly ended 12,000 years ago. How can that be if the Bible is true? So when are we going to put this? Where do we put this mammoth? Well, we put him between the flood and Moses. 
And uh, there's plenty of evidence for an ice age caused by the Genesis flood. And that's where you put it. Well, I was wondering about how long it would take to, because they say the ice age is several, you know, 500 years or more, that sort of thing. Uh, another quick question is, uh, I believe in the scriptural evidence, uh, you know, literally, but I don't think God dictated uh, to Bishop Usher how to handle those chronologies because there is a lot of disagreement with Bishop Usher's dating. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with uh, Wickham and Morris, the Genesis Flood? It, it, say that last part. Wickham and Morris's book, The Genesis Flood, yeah. which yeah. gets her, uh, Appendix 2 uh, argues that Bishop Usher's stating is incorrect and gives lots of good reasons for that. Um, I've never seen anybody uh, address that particular appendix line by line, and I think it needs to be done. Yeah, I agree. If you're going to hold a Bishop Usher stating, you're going to have to rebut that appendix. Yeah, I agree with you. By the way, I don't, I don't necessarily hold to his. I've read his histories. It's about that thick. It's really a fascinating book, by the way. He had access to documents and things that we no longer have today. But I don't necessarily hold to it. What I have done is just simply, which anybody can do, is just start adding up the numbers in Genesis. And uh, by the way, if we have a break in those chronologies, I don't, it doesn't dawn on people, but if we have a break in there, the connection between the patriarchs and the line of the Messiah is broken and lost. Let me tell you, let me give you an example. I'm related to William the Conqueror. Now all of you are thinking, ooh, 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 that's, that's kind of cool. None of you have stopped to realize, wait a minute, prove it. Well, how would I prove that I'm related to William the Conqueror? Well, so-and-so told me, no, that's not strong enough. You know what I have to do? I have to be able to show my father my father's father, my father's father's father, and so on, all the way back until William the Conqueror. Now, my mother did that. She traced it all the way back, and every single descendant is in place. Well, that is the only way I could dogmatically, conclusively show you that I descended from William the Conqueror. This is the only way the Messiah can do it, too. And if you put a gap in there, the connection is lost. So I trust the chronologies that are written there in Genesis. And then when I take a look at things that surface, things in geology or things in other archaeology and so on, somehow they have got to fit in this chronology. If I can't take the chronologies in Genesis at face value, let, let alone what Usher had to say, if I can study the chronologies and come up with a figure and if I can't take those at face value, I'm in trouble. I have to just kind of gloss over the Old Testament and just kind of hope that my faith in a risen person here who claimed to rise from the dead is in the right spot. But no, we, you know that. Believers have more than that. We, we have one more question here, but let me just give another answer to <coughs> Tom here. We had Michael Ord, another geologist, speak here a few months back. And he actually answered uh, Tom's first question, you know, when did the Ice Age occur? And that is after the time of Noah. And it, his title was, Only the Bible Explains the Ice Age. And yeah. uh, that, uh, that uh, lecture is recorded, so you can go back. Excellent. And, yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. Michael Ord, by the way, is considered to be the authority on a Genesis Ice Age today. He's considered to be the authority. One more question. May I just comment about that? About, about, the, about the Ice Age? Yeah. You know, there was no rainbow until after the flood, and the earth was watered by mist. In other words, there had never been rain, and there had never been any sunshine. But the earth was constantly under cloud cover, and it was kind of a mean temperature. And that's why in Alaska, those uh, gold mining monitors that washed down whole hillsides, which were uh, gravel bars, uh, found large leaves, like banana leaves. They call it the banana belt just out of Fairbanks, and uh, if uh, the flood ended and Noah got out of the boat in the winter time, and the clouds had broken over the Arctic, and we find these mastodons, you know, quick frozen, mm -hmm. and they're always quick frozen in gravel deposits and sand, sediments in other words, 
Uh, if there's a log house in the Arctic and you lost your roof and it's 70 below outside now, uh, you're quick frozen. And Usher, according to Usher, Noah stepped out of the ark on December 18th, Thursday. <laughs> Three days before the shortest day of the year. That's when the clouds broke open. It would have been really cold in the ark. <laughs> Let me just make a short comment here. Um, on this trip to Yellowstone, the Yellowstone is probably the laboratory for studying the Ice Age. There are more Ice Age features in Yellowstone National Park just about anywhere I know. You can find them isolated around the world. But my book catalogs those and uh, talks about the timing of an Ice Age after the flood and why a flood is connected to an Ice Age. A lot of it has to do with the the eruption of Yellowstone itself. The biggest volcanic eruption in Earth history, geologists tell us. I didn't say that, secular geologists tell us. Good night, the crater just from the most recent Yellowstone eruption is 45 miles across and 35 miles wide. You do not even know you're in the thing. You're driving around there going from Old Faithful to this to that. You're inside the crater. And that kind of an explosion would have produced an ice age that, and of course triggered by a number of other volcanic eruptions, that would have resulted in rapid snow buildup. And uh, of course we don't need cold weather. Uh, the Olympic Mountains are an example of that. The Olympic Mountains have 122 glaciers, and they're not very high out there. What are they? Their maximum is, what, 7,500 7, feet? But it's not cold in the Olympics. In fact, the last time we had snow here, it was really quite comfortable. It's only after you have snow that it gets cold weather. So rapid, rapid snow, and of course as the snow accumulates and presses down, it turns to ice. The ice then forms the glaciers. And then as the volcanic eruptions clear out, you've got more of the sun reflective energy, and you've got rapid, uh, catastrophic, Ice Age flooding. One of the biggest mysteries in Yellowstone National Park, according to secular geologists, is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. They can't explain it. I've hung around their little lectures, and they just they trip over it because they date the canyon as older than the Ice Age. Well, if that's the case, the Ice Age would have hollowed that out or, or, or kind of hollowed it out, turned it into a U-shaped valley. It's not. It's a big V-cut canyon. And the answer is staring them right in the face, but because of their bias against the scriptures, they can't interpret it correctly. So it, it, there's a lot on the Ice Age in this book that if you're interested, you could, the shameless plug it. Okay, let's uh, take one more question. It's not a question, but a statement. The one thing that you have to realize about geological processes is a lot of the times we hear about scientists say, okay, they say what, it takes a million to three and a half million years to make a diamond in the earth? Yeah. Yet we can do it in a lab in six to nine months? Yeah. What's wrong with that? The earth's that inefficient? <laughs> it, takes, it takes a half a billion years to make oil, but I can make a 55 gallon drum with my backyard white sweet crude out of turkey guts in 28 days? Yeah. I mean, so, I, I mean, all of these things are based on things we've heard all of our life about how long it takes the earth to do this, yet we can do it so much, we're so good that we can do it so much more efficiently than the earth. But here's the other thing, you know that they can make diamonds now out of peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll be by to get to my guests. <laughs> but anyway, let's give uh, Patrick a hand. And just uh, again to let you know, next uh, month we have Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor is from England, as you'll soon find out when he starts to, when he opens his mouth, he'll sound a little different. Uh, but he's going to speak on the topic of no compromise. You know, we uh, uh, believe the Bible for what it says. We believe that we have a young earth. Paul believes that.
and he's going to explain why these other compromising theories that people have you know, compromise what the Bible says, and even from science, they can't be shown to be.